Welcome to CHP Weight Loss Clinic. I'll be going through the beginnings of how to begin a weight loss program, and I'm Dr. Amy Neal. Uh, the purpose of this video is purely for education, is not intended for reproduction. I have no financial disclosures. Today we will review the beginnings of a weight loss program. I'll describe what a check-in is and how to do this with or without a health team. Introduce my other team members, review the definition of obesity, we'll discuss some basics and history, why this is of such importance to you, introduce the four pillars of weight loss medicine, and delve into our first topic, exercise. I'll quickly give some breakfast ideas, and we'll have a simple quiz at the end, and we'll go through together. Future lectures that will be recorded are also listed here. A check-in. These measures are a good way of tracking your progress. Weight can be done from home. Neck and waist circumference can be good measures for the clinic or if you just hate the scale. Measure with the same tape at the same place each time. For example, at the Adam's apple or belly button are good landmarks. Blood pressure cuffs for home are also useful. A resting heart rate can be determined by checking your pulse at your wrist and counting for 60 seconds. You want to be resting for at least 10 minutes before you check. Recovery heart rate can be checked at exactly 10 minutes after a workout. Sit or lay down for 10 minutes and then check your heart rate. Keep a log. Labs can also be useful. Several we check regularly are listed here. It is important that, especially if you're getting an insulin level, that it be fasting. While it may not be much fun to think about what these look like before you have begun a weight loss journey, getting this initial information can show you in the future how far you've come. It will become something that you are proud of. For example, many people will discover over time that blood sugar levels have normalized, cholesterol panels look better, and inflammatory markers go back to the normal range as the inches fall away. Lauren Ormsby has a master's in nutrition science and exercise science. She is the clinical research coordinator and project manager at Florida State University. Dr. Kemper is the associate director of the psychology clinic where she oversees the clinical practicum experience of the clinical psychology graduate students and therapists. I am a board certified in both family medicine and obesity medicine and have worked here at Capital Health Plan for the last 12 years. Here in this slide, we have our definitions for overweight, obesity, as well as what we would classify as being underweight. The healthy weight is shown here in yellow. This is a measurement that is just calculated. So when we talk about BMI, we're not specifically talking about excess fat, but what we're interested in with weight loss is really decreasing excess fat accumulation in the body, especially around the abdomen, where it has a negative impact on many aspects of health. Obesity is the elephant in the room. It causes dozens of physical, mental, emotional, and financial problems for people. It is misunderstood commonly as the result of overeating and under-exercising, but there is much more to it than that. To give a brief history, the real obesity epidemic began in the mid to late 80s with the advent of television, desk jobs, two-income households, fast food, TV dinners, spending more time in cars. It began in America and has spread throughout the world as American lifestyles have had their impact in other countries. As we can see from this graph, overweight numbers have remain relatively stable, but the people categorized as being obese or severely obese, which is a BMI over 40, have increased the most. These trends are especially frightening in children. Men are more likely to be overweight, but much less likely to become obese or severely obese. Please note that this is for people who have no history of any disease. This is the risk of death correlated with BMI. Men are in blue on the left and women are on red on the right. As BMI crosses over into the 40 range, we see that rates of death at two to four times as high for men and at least twofold for women. Studying this graph will also give us an idea of where many people may hope to get their BMI over time, down into more of the normal range, 
we also see that there is a certain morbidity and mortality associated with being underweight. Ailments worsened by or caused by obesity are numerous. We see at the top of the list here is sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes, uh, certain types of cancer are also related to obesity, specifically breast cancer, GI cancers, colon cancer, venous stasis, um, congestive heart failure, all kinds of artery disease, fatty liver is definitely related to obesity, weight loss is really the only successful treatment of fatty liver, polycystic ovary syndrome, knee arthritis, back arthritis has a definite correlation with BMI and reduces as your BMI decreases. There's a condition called pseudotumor cerebri, which affects your vision, sexual function and hormone changes, fertility. There's also a correlation with Alzheimer's and depression, uh, which is especially concerning given the increasing age of people with obesity in the United States. There are many causes of excess weight that people don't necessarily have control over. Some things we do have control over, and we will focus on those, but I did want to tell the group about some of these correlations. For example, weight is more hereditary than height. A child with one obese parent has a 50% chance of being obese themselves. When both parents are obese, the children have an 80% chance of becoming obese. A 2.8-fold risk of obesity is seen if the baby was large for gestational age or born to a mom with gestational diabetes, 22% reduction in lifetime chance of becoming overweight with breastfeeding. We also see a 1.5-fold increase if experiencing early childhood trauma. Children 1 to 6 who have one serving of fruit juice a day have an increased risk of obesity. Screen time, more than two hours a day, is associated with a 67% increase in risk of obesity, and removing it improves rates. Eating ultra-processed food can be a cause. An Australian study shows 61% chance of developing diabetes if eaten regularly. The British Medical Journal and Gut Magazine did an analysis of more than 333,000 children in the military system and found that antibiotics consumed in the first two years of life were associated with a 26% heightened increase of obesity by the age of three. Certain other medications uh, can cause obesity, which we'll go through in another lecture. Eating disorders often play a role. Depending on the demographic, wealth and poverty can also be protective or risk factors. Perceived stress can also play a role. I won't get too much into this slide, but I did want to mention that the cost of obesity for the American healthcare system is astronomic. Um, we're talking trillions of dollars, as you can see here, at least billions, um, even if this is an overestimation. If we were to just get people back to a normal BMI, this would be the estimated savings, according to at least one calculation. The treatment of obesity. This is a big money industry in America. Healthcare, we spend $190 billion, or nearly 21% of the annual medical spending in the U.S. Childhood obesity alone is responsible for $14 billion in direct costs. The total U.S. weight loss market grew an estimated 4% in 2018 to $72 billion. The total market is forecasted to grow 2.6% annually through 2023. What I also wanted to go through um, is the America's Biggest Loser data at six years. Um, this is con a concerning finding is, I think we've all heard about the America's Biggest Losers. It's the competition where People start out overweight, and then they do diet and exercise, and then they're presented at the end of their challenge. And what they looked at is, how are these people doing at six years? And what shocked the researchers is what happened next. As the years went by and the numbers on the scale climbed, the contestants' metabolism did not recover. It was as if their bodies were intensifying the efforts to pull the contestants back to their original weight. Um, and this is the yo-yo effect that we see in America. Uh, we can see that some people did succeed and they continued to lose weight. Many main, maintained it, but a lot of the contestants gained their weight back. Um, and we'll talk about what happened there in a few minutes. 
All right, so what works? You know, we, we know the causes a little bit about it. We know the history here. What really makes a difference, what evidence has shown, is that people who lost 10% or more of their body weight and kept it off at five to 10 years, uh, a lot of it was activity, diet restraint or food logging, frequent self-weighing or doing measurements, and meal timing, cognitive behavioral therapy, certainly addressing any uh, eating disorders that are out there, certain motivational interviewing techniques, family and group support makes a big difference. I wrote down neat exercise here, which means non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So something you're doing that's not exercise that also just gets you more activity and steps in a day. Weight training makes a difference, yoga, reducing screen time, because if you're not doing screen time, you're probably doing something else. Certain medications can make a big difference. Treating sleep apnea can also be very useful. Maybe certain vitamins, maybe not, depending. Um, and certainly surgeries have proven to be very helpful. These are the four pillars of obesity treatment. Nutrition, physical activity, behavior, and medication. We will get into each of them in turn. Today, we will focus on physical activity. Physical activity. So what works the best? Walking is king because we can do it anywhere, anytime, any place. Doesn't have to be a large walk, long walk. Doesn't have to necessarily be a certain speed, but just any kind of walking. Um, aerobic activity is wonderful. We wanna try and shoot for about 60 minutes five days a week. Aerobic plus resistance is very good for maintaining weight loss. We see this pretty consistently in the study with the America's Biggest Losers. It was the people who were doing aerobic plus resistance and maintain their exercise after the study was done that were able to actually maintain their weight loss. Balance, flexibility, strength, and endurance also play a big role in just helping us feel better, reducing fall risk, uh, injuries, and of course, can just be rewarding of their own merits. They're uh, maintainable and fun. It's important to pick something that you really enjoy when you're thinking about doing exercise. We really want it to be fun so that you get that endorphin rush. Um, it'll also reduce blood pressure, reduce stress, sleep, Sleep quality is improved. We have decreased pain levels in people who exercise. Skin elasticity actually changes, so we'll see less wrinkles, less sagging skin, and energy levels improve as well. It's one of those catch-22s, you know, I'm too tired to exercise, but exercise oftentimes is what is giving us our energy. Physical activity. There are many places to exercise, many ideas for how to get some extra help. Often, we'd like the assistance of a trainer or coach or need motivation from a class or friend to be a workout partner. Think about your style and what might work well for you. You may also want to look into new exercises if you're bored with what you're doing presently. Do you have to work around an injury, for example? YouTube is a great resource for Tai Chi videos and Amazon Prime has numerous free yoga videos that are great for beginners or experts. There are also other workout videos for free, like high intensity interval training. Fitness trackers can make logging exercise and monitoring a lot easier. You may already have some of this technology built into a device you have. Your watch or phone are common ways to track. Setting them up can be tricky, but once they're set up, they make life a lot easier. If you want to manage something, you have to measure it. Setting a reasonable exercise goal is very important. We want this to be something that is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. For example, you may want to start with taking a short walk, reducing screen time, standing instead of sitting, take activity breaks throughout the day, keep doing something you're already doing well. For example, if we wanted to set up a SMART goal, we would say, to be specific, I want to be walking or marching in place. To make it measurable, I'll say 10 minutes, four days a week, or create a place to track it. And then I wanna make it attainable, so I'll make it easy to fit into my schedule, even on a busy day, that 10 minutes is definitely attainable. Relevant, 
So it should be something that would make a difference and it should be time-based, only one week at a time. Spell out when you'll check in and what you did. And you may even want to check your status midweek. So this is a good sample exercise routine from the Cleveland Clinic. It shows you how you can slowly increase the minutes you're doing and the exercise to avoid injury and allow your body to acclimate to the new activity. This will avoid problems like plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendonitis. Check your heart rate 10 minutes after the workout and see what your recovery heart rate is. Lower is better and watch it drop as the weeks go by and fitness increases. Here's a similar schedule that goes over resistance training. It's also from the Cleveland Clinic. This can be done with weights and should include both arms and legs as well as core muscles. Squats, lunges, calf raises, crunches, supermans, deadlifts, bicep tricep curls, rows and upper back exercises are some of the things that you could put into this routine. So this puts everything together. We can see Monday will begin with 10 minutes of walking and maybe a round of balance exercises. Something like yoga or Tai Chi would be good. On Tuesday we'll be doing 10 minutes of walking and maybe some biking and then some flexibility work, a gentle stretching and breathing session. Each session can be five to 10 minutes in the beginning weeks, or when you're short on time, you can decrease the amount of time. Minutes total can be added together. For example, if I'm supposed to get 40 minutes of aerobic exercise in a day, I can walk 10 minutes in the morning, do three five minute activity breaks at work throughout the day, and then get in 15 more minutes dancing in my living room, which would be about three songs. The goal is a total of 200 to 350 minutes a week, or only 28 to 50 minutes a day. Making it happen. Be sure you have supportive shoes, especially ankle and arch support. Be comfortable, be confident, bring your smile, it's the most important part. Put in those headphones and let it roll. If you're thinking about a class, maybe look into the Senior Center, the City of Tallahassee classes, like Aqua Aerobics, or church groups often have some good exercise programs. If it's causing pain, you may not be doing the right exercise or may be doing the exercise incorrectly. Take time to learn proper form. You can do whatever you want to do. The five second rule can also be helpful. When you're struggling with internal negative talk, just count down from five to one. When you get to one, you have to move in the direction your true inner voice is telling you to go toward positive change and also maybe away from the vending machine. Breakfast ideas. So here's some ideas I got from my Fitness Pal blog. Some breakfast burritos that you could make a day or two in advance might double as a good snack or another meal. The mushroom cheddar omelets with some fresh greens is another breakfast that brings in protein, fat, and healthy, fiber-rich, vitamin-packed carbs. Overnight, protein apple cinnamon oats are another common, healthy, but very fast and easy breakfast idea. Again, these can be found on the MyFitnessPal blog, which is on the phone app for MyFitnessPal, which is free. And bowlofdeliciousideas.com is another great resource. This is a list of my references. Quiz. So what are the four pillars of obesity treatment? Does anybody remember? Today we went over exercise, you can certainly look back, but the others are nutrition, behavior, and medicine. We'll go over these in future talks. Which is a habit people who maintain weight loss do? Do they exercise regularly? Do they ignore the scale? Do they stick with one specific diet only? Do they eat breakfast in bed? <laughs> they exercise regularly. If you guessed A, you are correct. What is the king of exercise for weight loss? We talked about it and it is walking or aerobic exercise. Walking is good for all comers. Which exercise goal will you set this week? This one is individualized, of course. Walking, dance, activity breaks, yoga, whatever you want to do. That's it for this lecture. Please check in soon for the remaining lectures. I'm wishing you the best of success and a healthy future. 
With the right tools and information, you can absolutely succeed and attain a healthier weight. Remember, you can do anything that you want to do.